and we're coming towards the end of the series. So I decided on an experiment. We wrote one of the saint stories that had uh, Roger Moore and an American, and we experimented with the idea of the persuaders. Uh, instead of uh, um, uh, an American whiz kid from, um, from Brooklyn, which eventually wound up as with Tony Curtis, we, um, we tried to text an oil millionaire and uh, we tried an episode of The Saint and it worked very, very well. So with that idea in mind, we took the whole idea of the persuaders to Lou Grade, who was the company that, um, now Lord Grade, who was the company that, um, uh, that was responsible for the saint, sold him the idea of an American and Roger Moore and the whole idea of the persuaders, and he said, go ahead, make it. The only thing we had to do was to find a suitable American to um, play opposite Roger Moore. Uh, Lou set up a deal with ABC Network in America and uh, we went across for discussions for casting the American role. Our first intention was to try to get Rock Hudson but um, we couldn't get him. The next possibility was an actor whom you probably know called Glenn Ford, who um, was to play the American. And uh, he wasn't available. So we had a meeting with the networks and we sat down and I said to them, look, you give me a list of American actors you would like in the show and I'll see who, who we can get. And they went through a list of some actors and someone mentioned Tony Curtis. I said, well, fine, let's see whether we can get Curtis. Uh, Lou spoke to Curtis's agent. Curtis was interested, we went to Los Angeles, the original discussions were in New York. We went to Los Angeles, we met with Curtis, we sold him the idea and he agreed to do it. So that's how we got Tony Curtis and um, Roger Moore. It altered the format slightly, instead of a Texan or millionaire, we had a, a New York uh, street kid who had become a very a very rich man and that's basically how the series started so we we did a trial run firstly in the saint and it worked and we went ahead and we made the show we knew the show was going to be expensive because television never used two stars like roger moore and tony curtis before tony curtis had never made a television show before he was a feature player roger had made a great success with the saint uh, so we knew it was going to be expensive and we decided that we will go for broke we will really make a very glossy expensive we had expensive actors, we we'll make an expensive looking show, and it, it worked very well. It, uh, the show was highly successful. Let's see, we started filming in the south of France in May 1970, I think it was, and um, we stayed in France for about six to eight weeks, and we shot the backgrounds or some scenes from about six different episodes. Um, we then went back to London and we did the studio interiors so that we linked up all the six episodes that we shot in the south of France with uh, the, the interiors in London. Um, we also shot for a couple of days in Paris um, as well for one of the episodes. Um, 
The rest of them was all shot in the United Kingdom, but we we used um, studio sets for foreign locations. Um, we would send second units out to different countries to get the background material with doubles and cars and so on and so forth. It was, in television terms, a fairly expensive and very glossy series. You start off with uh, two very, very experienced actors uh, and they had an immediate rapport with each other. Uh, we encouraged them to ad-lib. In other words, we had the script written, but we said, use your own words. And um, we wanted to encourage spontaneity in the, in the show, to make it look as, it was, if, as if the actors were thinking the things up as they were going along, and they were, in fact. As long as they kept within the framework of the story, every take was slightly different. The big problem was, if we have two or three takes on the scene, each take was different. So we had to... So what we invariably used to do was we would shoot across close-up or something, and pick the best of each scene and meld them together, and that's how the show worked. It was very much a, um, a hit-and-miss idea, but the fact that we had two such good artists made the thing work thoroughly. It, it, it came at a particularly... The, the 60s was a marvellous time in Europe. In fact, throughout the world, it was a whole new new era was opening up and and the show reflected the carefree atmosphere of of that particular period very very well indeed uh yes there were pretty girls in it there was expensive cars there was expensive sets and and it was a a, a period of of, of uh, i i suppose affluence uh, after the dim years of the war and the immediate following up of the war, the 60s changed everything. With the Beatles in 1962 or whatever, um, the whole thing changed for the next 10 years and we kind of cashed in on that particular um, mode of living. Oh, they, as I said, they're, they're, they're two very experienced actors. They're, they're professionals. Um, they got on very well indeed. They, uh, they, they would try to outdo each other on the set, which, was, which worked fine for the show. It, 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 had, a, it had a sort of a, a, a competition between them all the time, and I think that came over in, in, in the finished result. We made, I think it was 24 episodes. Uh, it took us just about a year to, to film, yeah. Uh, we estimated two weeks per episode. Um, it, 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 normal episodes were about 10 days then, but we, we took the liberty of, 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 of spending a little more time on the show and just to give it the kind of quality we needed. Um, well, we were thinking of doing another series of Persuaders when Roger Moore was offered the James Bond part. And obviously... Um, one wouldn't stand in his way to um, play James Bond, which was going to be an ongoing thing. So with Roger gone, we decided not to do any more shows. There was talk about replacing Roger with someone else, but then we thought about it and, and we felt, no, we, we, we've done 24, we're happy with them, let's, let's forget it, let's leave it at that. What, what, when we started the show, we just certainly had no idea it was going to be a cult show, uh, which which has developed over the years. Uh, our main market was to 
uh, uh, to do uh, 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 to make a, su a success in America, but unfortunately, uh, the, the, when the show was first made, the first country to show the Persuaders was Australia, and it was a big, big hit in Australia. And usually, Australia and America usually uh, 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 tend to agree with their. With our um, television, uh, but when we opened the show in uh, in America, it never quite got off the ground. I think the real problem was that the show was ahead of its time. It was tongue in cheek, uh, a parody of of uh, of action adventure, not serious. And the Americans are not used to this kind of um, th this kind of show. Their drama series was drama, and was all done very very seriously. And the villains were villainous, and the heroes were uh, w heroic. But our heroes were bumbling. They were inexperienced, supposedly, and they were somehow or other managed to get through their adventures unscathed and and uh, and uh, to a happy conclusion which was n not accepted in america they felt that it was they couldn't make up their mind whether it was drama or comedy mm -hmm. it was a particular type of what we call british humor which kind of sends things up Americans take their things very seriously. Many years later, um, uh, that kind of show has caught on in America with shows like Moonlighting, which again sent itself up as, uh, as a detective series. So I think our problem was we were just ahead of our time by about 15 years. But there you are, that's that showbiz, you can never be sure what's going to happen. The great George Bernard Shaw once said that, 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 that um, Britain and America are divided by the same language. And this is very true because uh, although we speak the same language and we, we have a culture very, very similar, there's a great deal of difference between the British and the Americans. And this is what we based our comedy on. You know, the British attitude towards one thing and the American attitude. And although they're both trying to get there uh, uh, in their own particular way, their methods of, uh, of doing things are totally different. So we base our comedy on the British-American misconceptions that exist between the two nations so that was the basis of the comedy the basic idea of the title was to explain the backgrounds of our two characters even before they appeared on the screen uh, and rather than go into lengthy scenes which would develop their character and their upbringing and so forth, we decided to somehow compact this into a title. Uh, so you had shots of, uh, of um, Tony Curtis as a young man and, and a boy, and Roger, the, the, the shot of Roger as a boy was in fact the shot of his son. Uh, and. Uh, we followed their progress by uh, by the um, by by the titles until uh, uh, until we actually by the time we met the characters we knew about them that was the whole point of the titles and John Barry's music was quite unique it was a different sort of sound it had a different kind of quality to it that that worked very very well it had a kind of a <sighs> I don't know. It 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 almost had a Russian uh, 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 feel to the music um, uh, that that seemed to work. Uh, John Barry is a very very clever man as far as music is concerned, and he really we wanted something quite different.
to the normal theme music of, of 